right, good morning, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It's the day the Lord has made. Let us be glad. Let us rejoice. We're going to stand if you're able and worship God. We're going to sing of God's goodness this morning. It's good to think about the goodness of God. It helps us draw close to him and honor him and praise him. In the midst of a generation where so many are leaving the Lord and not really listening to what the word of God says, let us be a people that honor him with our lives. I want to scream it out from every mountain top. Your goodness knows no bounds. Your goodness never stops. Your mercy follows me. Your kindness fills my life. Your love amazes me. And I sing because you are good. And I dance because you are good. And I shout because you are good. You are good to me, to me. And I sing because you are good. And I dance because you are good. And I shout because you are good. You are good to me, to me. Nothing and no one comes anywhere close to you. The earth and oceans deep only reflect this truth. And in my darkest night, you shine as bright as day. Your love amazes me. And I sing. And I sing because you are good. And I dance because you are good. And I shout because you are good. You are good to me, to me. And I sing because you are good. Dance because you are good, and I shout because you are good, you are good to me. And with a cry of praise, my heart will proclaim you are good, you are good, and in the sun or rain, my life self. You are good, you are good, with a cry of praise, and with a cry of praise, my heart will proclaim, you are good, you are good, and in the sun or rain, my life celebrates, you are good. You are good, and I sing because you are good, and I dance because you are good, and I shout because you are good, you are good to me, to me, and I sing because you are good, and I dance because you are good, and I shout because you are good, you are good to me, to me. And I sing because you are good, and I dance because you are good, and I shout because you are good, you are good to me, to me. And I sing because you are good, and I dance because you are good, and I shout because you are good, you are good to me. Thanks this morning. Thank you, God. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears 
are gone. Cause I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Cause I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. From my mother's womb, you have chosen me. Love has called my name. I've been born again into your family. Your blood flows through my veins. I'm no longer. Cause I'm no longer a slave. child of God. You split the sea. You split the sea so I could walk right through it. My fears were drowned in perfect love. You rescued me so I could stand and sing. I am a child I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Because I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. good thing there's so many it reminds us of so many times how the children of Israel would as they were journeying with the Lord out of Egypt there were so many fears that they had that kept them from the promises of God when they desired to do what they wanted they even went so much as to make a golden calf to replace God and whenever we try to replace God with something else in our lives it always goes very badly you know always goes very badly let us be those people that trust him, no matter how things look, that trust him to walk with him in faith and in love. Thank you. 
shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home for joy shall fill my heart then I shall bow in humble adoration and there sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art. How great thou art. We sing that one more time. How great. How great thou art. How great thou art. So, Father, we thank you this morning that you are great. You are mighty. You are wonderful. You are good. We have been here set aside as your people, set apart from the world to do your good pleasure and to do your will. Let us be a people that stay faithful to you. Let us be not those that depart wickedly and go our own way, but let us be those that honor you with our hearts and mind, fulfilling the commandments of God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And everybody said, amen. Jimmy was sick of it. He was sick of having to eat vegetables for dinner. He was sick of having to go to bed at 9 o'clock. He was sick of having only a PlayStation 19 when all his friends had PlayStation 25s. He was sick of the fact that he had rules and chores, that he had to make his own bed. He even had to make his own lunch in the mornings before he went to school. He was sick of it. His friend Billy down the street didn't have to do those things. His friend Billy got to stay up till 11 o'clock. Billy had a PlayStation 25, and Billy didn't have to eat vegetables. Billy didn't even have to make his own lunch. And so Jimmy decided it was time, because he'd had enough. And so he walks down the hall, on a Saturday morning, 
And he sees his parents there in the kitchen. And he says, Mom, Dad, I've had it. And he tells them his list of complaints. And he says, I'm leaving. And they say, well, Jimmy, that's not a good idea. Uh, you shouldn't do that because here you eat. And you may not like everything that you're given, but at least you have food. Uh, you may not like all the rules in this house, but at least you have a roof over your head. Uh, you may not like that you have to make your bed, but at least you get to sleep in one. Uh, and things tend to look better, you think, but it may not be quite as good as you think somewhere else. And Jimmy said, I don't care. I'm leaving. And so Jimmy went to his room, and he got his backpack that his parents had bought him from school, and he packed in it the clothes that his mom had gotten for him. Uh, he put in a baseball that an uncle had given him for his birthday, a flashlight, Swiss Army knife that his father had given him, and then he went to the kitchen. And he went to the pantry, and he he uh, made himself a sandwich with food that his parents had bought. He got some, a bag of chips and some cookies and, and a drink. And his mom said to him, Jimmy, this really isn't a good idea. You shouldn't do this. He said, no, I'm doing it, Mom. And so his parents let Jimmy walk out the door. And he got on the bike that he had been given for Christmas, and he rode down the street. He rode to Billy's house. Now, what Jimmy didn't know is that uh, Jimmy's parents had called Billy's parents and said, hey, he's running away. You know, it's okay to feed him. We know about it. And so he uh, shows up at his friend's house, not knowing that dad uh, was sitting in his car uh, a few houses down watching him. And he stayed for a while. He got to he had to eat peanut butter and jelly sandwich with no vegetables. He had to spend the afternoon playing on the PlayStation 25. And then at supper time, when he sat down and ate with Billy's family, it started to feel kind of weird because even though there were no vegetables, it still wasn't quite as good as mom's cooking. Uh, the conversation was different than what he was used to. And as he sat there, he realized, though I know these people, I tend to feel like a stranger. And so after dinner, uh, Jimmy stood up. He said, all right, it's time for me to go. And he walks out. The sun is setting. And Dad is still watching. And he gets on his bike. And he looks down the street towards his house. And he looks the other way into the approaching darkness. And Jimmy has a decision to make. This is the exact same thing that you and I have done. This is the exact same thing that people do. Because God tells us what his will is in his word. And then we take the very things that he's given us to do it our way and to rebel. We, people use the brains that God gave them to pursue their own idols and their own interests. People use the, the bodies that God gave them to do whatever makes them feel good. Uh, they use the, the intelligence and the resources and maybe even the position in life and the country they live in and the wealth of their parents to get a great education and pursue money, pursue money, pursue success, or whatever it is. We use the very things that God has given us to run away from him, and God lets us. It's uh, the prodigal son went to his dad and said, hey, dad, I wish you were dead. Since you're not, can I at least have your stuff? I want my inheritance now. And dad actually lets him go because dad has to make an effort to sell land to give the boy his inheritance in the form of cash, which the boy goes and spends what had been given to him. But even when God allows rebellion, he never loses control. He is still in charge. Even when he allows us to run away, he is still at work. And he's still working good. And we see that this morning in 1 Samuel chapter 8. In this chapter, uh, the Israelites are going to reject God. And God's going to let them. So let's see what happens. This is in 1 Samuel chapter 
8, beginning in verse 1. When Samuel became old, he made his sons judges over Israel. Now, I'll tell you right now, that's a problem. Because the, the arrangement, the kind of government that Israel was supposed to have is that God was their king. God was in charge. And so the judges were only supposed to be temporary. When something went wrong, they call out to God for help. He provides them a judge for that moment. But it wasn't supposed to be hereditary, passed on from generation to generation. But Samuel makes his sons judges. Verse 2, the the name of his firstborn son was Joel, and the name of his second Abijah, and they were judges in Beersheba. The The names, I think, reveal a little bit about Samuel's desire. Joel means Yahweh is God, and Abijah means God is uh, Yahweh is father. I think it's reasonable for us to assume that Samuel uh, was a godly uh, parent and a good parent. Look at verse 3. Yet his sons did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes. And perverted justice. And so they're given the judgeship. Right? And that's not, they're not appointed by God. They're not, they don't earn it. They just receive it from dad. And they take bribes. Because judges not only led and ruled. They also actually had a type of a courtroom. And made decisions. Uh, ruled in disputes. And these guys are taking extra money to rule in your favor. God hates this. If you've read the prophets, especially the minor prophets in the Bible, you see that God is on the side of those who are oppressed, those who are cheated, those who uh, have been abused, those for whom that somebody with more power has uh, mistreated them just because they have less power. Uh, God hates perverted justice, and these guys do it. This is an interesting and important Uh, verse in scripture i think because it affirms that you are not responsible uh, for what your grown children do now you are responsible for what you do as a parent and there are certainly good and bad choices and there may even be things you've done that that affect them in what they do but ultimately it's their decision and their responsibility they can choose whether or not to follow your good example or whether or not to not follow your bad example. And so this verse is, I think, a reassurance to parents that if a child rebels, right, the responsibility is on them, uh, on, that ch- on that grown child. But I would say you want to make sure that if that's the case, that you were a godly parent. Because we see people today walking away from Jesus. There are lots of deconversion stories now you can you can see them on youtube you can listen to them on podcasts and people talk about how they have used to believe and now they don't and one of the things that uh, common threads because i've listened and watched quite a few of them one of the common threads of these stories is the version of christianity that they were shown is not necessarily accurate to jesus in a whole lot of these cases they weren't shown the jesus of scripture They were shown a legalistic Jesus or judgmental Jesus or hypocritical Jesus or Jesus on the back shelf somewhere. And so what they're walking away from is not the real Jesus, but a version of Jesus that they were shown by those in authority over them. And so if your kids walk away from the faith, let it be that they're walking away from the real Jesus and not a false version that has been shown to them. Because it may be that if a false version of Jesus was shown to you, you might walk away too. Verse 4. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel and Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old. Thanks a lot. You are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. Now they're actually right. Samuel's old. He's not going to live forever, right? They're correct about that, so they're thinking about their future. Okay, we can understand that. And his sons, who are supposedly going to be his successors, don't walk in Samuel's ways. In other words, they're not righteous and good and godly uh, like Samuel is. So 
That's true. That is a real problem. They are right about their diagnosis. They are correct about the problem. And they are right. It's an issue that needs to be dealt with. They're right. Their diagnosis is correct. Their prescription is not. Look at their solution. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. Now this is interesting, right? The pro part of the problem here is that these judges who have taken over Samuel's sons, uh, it has happened because of heredity, right? Because of who their daddy was, not because they were qualified or because God appointed them. And so their, their alternative is appoint us a king so that we can have a monarchy. And how does succession work in a monarchy? Hereditary. So <laughs> they're really making uh, their problem official. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. Now at this point, when I read this, every time I read this, I, I hear it in a whiny voice. Every time. Well, everybody else has a king. Why can't we have a king? We want a king. It's not fair they have kings and we don't have a king. Why do you do it like this? We want to be like everybody else. They have it better than they we do. We want a king like all the nations. Now think about that. At this time period, Israel are the people of God. They worship the one true God of the universe, the only God. And we want a king like all the pagan nations. So I will say to you, if you have a, a diagnosis of a problem in your life, you may be accurate. But if you choose as a prescription the same thing that the sinful world chooses, it's the wrong prescription. If what you're doing is the same thing that people with worldly, anti-God, selfish values do, if that's what you choose as your solution, it's the wrong solution. Now, appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. We want to be like the pagans. And this happens to us as Christians. We look at what worldly people have and we get jealous. Only seeing what we think is the good part and not seeing the bad part. A king to judge us instead of a judge to judge us. So look at what they're doing here. God is supposed to be their king, but they want a human king. God is supposed to be their judge, and they want a human judge. So what happens next? Well, after they opt out of the covenant, because that's basically what they're doing. God had made a covenant with them that he would be their God and they would be his people and that he would rule and judge and take care of them. And they opt out of the co covenant. So what happens next? Well, before I show you, I want to say there's another warning here for us. The other warning is that though we can learn things as a church from the outside world, though all truth is God's truth. And if, if some non-Christian person has stumbled across some kind of a principle that is a good principle, then it's okay to learn from that. But we need to be careful about trying to make the church look like the world. The church is not a business. Just because you do a particular thing in your workplace does not necessarily mean that that's the way the church should function. Now, there are, like I said, there are things that can be learned, but we need to remember the church is not a business. The church is not a worldly organization it is the lord's church and it needs to be done god's way because it's his church so what happens next look at verse six but the thing displeased samuel when they said give us a king to judge us and samuel prayed to the lord now in hebrew it's a little bit of stronger language it more literally as the thing was evil to samuel he's upset about it he sees it as sinful, and rightly so, because they are rejecting God's control over them. They are rebelling over them. And it's possible, probable even, that he's taking it somewhat personally. Well, wasn't I a good judge? Wasn't I godly? I think there are some personal feelings here, which we'll see in a moment. And so Samuel prays. What does he pray for? I think he tells God what's happening. And I, and I think that he asked God, well, what do we do next? And I think that probably he's going to be very surprised by the answer. Look at verse 7. And the Lord said to Samuel, obey the voice of the people and all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. Listen to them. 
So here's what God does. God says, you go tell them, okay. Like, like Jimmy's parents letting him run away, right? God says, all right, we're going we're gonna to give you what you want. And God says, do this because they have not rejected you. They have rejected me from being king over them. Now, there's two important things to learn from this statement. One is that this is an encouragement to Samuel. Hey, Samuel, it's not you, it's me. Right? It's not you they have issue with because you've been doing what I've told you to do. Their real issue is with me. So this is a comforting word to Samuel, but there's something else here. Do this because they haven't rejected you, they've rejected me. In other words, it's my call, not yours. The real issue here is not between them and you. The real issue is between them and me. So you let me handle it. When you are doing godly and righteous things, do not be surprised when people persecute you, when they are against you. Why? Because they're against God. And so in that sense, this is an encouraging word. But make sure that it's because you are doing what God wants you to do and not because you're acting like Samuel's sons. But if you are being obedient to God and you are being rejected because of that, then it's God they're rejecting. And it's not your job to punish, right? It's not your job to judge. Their issue is between them and the Lord. The next time somebody cusses you out or flips you the finger, right, or makes your life difficult or does something sinful, you know what? They've got a much bigger problem than their relationship with you. It's between them and God, really. Let God handle it. You'll feel much better. It's not your problem, right? It's between them and the Lord. Also, be careful about misusing this statement because God is saying this here. Be careful about religious leaders who's, who misquote this passage and say, every time you disagree with something I say, you're rejecting God. That's simply not true. Because there is only one perfect leader, and that would be Jesus. And so every human leader that God has given us makes mistakes or might be wrong. And so disagreement is not the same as rejecting the Lord. However, the thing to be careful about, is the leader right? Is the leader listening to God here? Is the leader uh, seeing this in Scripture? But this should not be misused by power-hungry religious leaders who hate dissension, and want to be little dictators. This is God saying this. Jesus said, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. And then later in Matthew chapter 10, he said, A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If they've called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? They're calling me the devil. What do you think they're going to do to you? So don't be discouraged. If you're being obedient to Jesus, if you're doing what Jesus commanded, if you're sharing the gospel, if you are living out the gospel and Christ through you is showing who he is, don't be discouraged when you're persecuted. They persecuted Jesus, they'll persecute you, but make sure it's because you're being obedient to Jesus. When I've had people say they don't go to church anymore, they don't believe anymore, they don't like organized religion, or whatever the deal is, because somebody bearing the name Christian mistreated them, I say to them, please do not blame Jesus for when somebody bearing his name disobeyed Jesus. And so, what happens? God is going to let them have what they want. It's a form of judgment, by the way. See, Jimmy was forced to feel a little bit of what happened when he ran away. God judging is not just him pouring fire from heaven or having some kind of immediate consequence. God also judges by just letting people do what they want to do. Because when he allows that, right, the consequence comes back. And so this is his judgment on them for rejecting him as king. It's to say, okay, I'll give you what you want. Look at verse 10. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking for a king from him. He said, these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots, to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. And he will appoint 
it for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his servants. He will take the tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and to his servants. He will take your male servants and female servants and the best of your young men and your donkeys and put them to his work. He will take the tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. And in that day you will cry out because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. In other words, you're going to get what you ask for. And they do get what they ask for, by the way, because they get Saul. Saul, who is taller than any other man, who is ha more handsome than any other man, who is a great warrior. They get exactly what they ask for. And it turns out, well, it's like God said that it would. If you and I are using the world's way of solving problems, it will eventually come back and bite us. Now, turning to political so solutions... In and thinking only about the benefit and not the cost is not a new problem. This is not just something that happens in American politics. It's been around for a really long time. Hey, we want a person that's going to solve our problems and give us stuff and make our life easier without any thought that everything comes with a cost. Somebody will pay at some point. But humans tend to not think like that. Oh, we want a solution right now. And not even think about the cost. In verse 19, but the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, no, but there shall be a king over us. Now they're declaring it, right? There shall be a king over us, that we may also be like all the nations. See what's important to them. And that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. God was supposed to be their king, and they've rejected him as king. God is their judge, and they're rejecting him as judge. And God himself fights their battles, and they're rejecting him as their warrior. This is why they're finally free of the Philistines. We saw that last week. It is because God fought the battle, not the Israelites. All they did was clean up. And already they want a human and so what happens? Verse 21, and when Samuel had heard all the words of the people, he repeated them in the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, obey their voice and make them a king. And Samuel then said to the men of Israel, go every man to his city. So it's going to happen, just not right away. The process begins, and we see it in the next chapter. But God is at work. You see, even though they have rejected God's control, God is still in control. He is allowing this with a purpose. Why? Here's what's going to happen. Saul's going to become king. They're going to see what happens when you have a worldly king. And then they're going to cry out for something else. And David is going to come, a man after God's own heart. And from David will come Jesus, who is king not only of, over Israel, but king over the world. You see, even when people reject God's control, God is still in control. And ultimately, it all leads to Jesus. Jesus, who is better. Jesus, who is better than any human king. When he was standing before Pilate, Jesus answered Pilate in John 18, 36. My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. And so the of here doesn't just mean, well, it's not earthly in a physical material sense, but it's also not from the world. It's not like the world. It doesn't have worldly values. Jesus is not that kind of king. Ultimately, God gives us, gives us a king over the earth, over the new heavens and new earth, and over our hearts and over God's kingdom. He gives us a king who is not of or from or like the world. Praise the Lord. Be glad for that. He has given us a better king. Because when people reject God's control, God is still in control. 
Remember what Samuel told the people. You will have a king who will take your sons for, as soldiers, who will take your sons to plow his ground and his harvest. Which means, by the way, you won't have your sons to play, plow your ground, and you're going to have to come out of retirement to plow yours. And not just your sons, but your daughters. He's going to take a tenth of your grain and your vineyards. And not only that, he's going to take the best of it for himself to pay the servants he just took from your family. He's going to take your stuff and your flocks and your servants. And that day you will cry out because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. But he does answer someday. And he did. Because the world's kings take. Jesus is a king who gives. A king from the world will take your sons from you. God gave his son to you. The world's kings will make you fight his battles. Jesus fought the battle for you and won when he died on the cross and rose again. A worldly king will take the best from your fields, and God gave us his best when he gave us his only son. A worldly king will take a tenth of your stuff and a lot more. Jesus gives you all of himself. And because Jesus is God, you receive God himself to know God. A king takes a tenth or more of what you give or what you have. But Jesus gives you everything. A king will make you slaves. But Jesus sets you free. A worldly king loves power. Jesus loves you. Jesus is a king whose justice is different than human kings. Listen to our king's justice. Paul says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in King Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Our king was and is just. Our king received God's justice and on him took our punishment, though he was sinless, so that you and I would be justified through our faith and our trust in our king and what he did for us. And so Jesus gives and receives justice, and he justifies us. That's our king. He is not like the world's kings. So what do we learn from this? When you reject God's control, God is still in control. When other people reject God's control, God is still in control. You must avoid the temptation to solve the world's problems the world's way. And trust that God is in control when you mess up or when others do. And allow whatever happens, good or bad, bring your attention back to Jesus, who is our king. Please join me as we pray. Our Heavenly Father, we heard here from the scripture, to have faith in Jesus means to be justified. For those who are here who have not yet trusted in Christ and said of themselves for forgiveness, I pray that would happen even during this prayer. And we pray that you would show yourself to us. Lord, forgive us and forgive me when I try worldly solutions <laughs> to my problems. Lord, we thank you that you saw the real issue, which is our relationship with you. Lord, help us to see that again and again and again, to see the real issue and to see the real solution. And so we thank you for Jesus. I pray that you would fill our vision with Christ, that no matter what we see in the world, we would know and believe that Jesus is better. We pray these things in his name. Amen.
you're able and to willing to stand, we are going to worship with a couple more songs to the Lord. Blessed Savior, Thou hast promised, Thou will all our burdens bear. May we ever, Lord, be bringing all to Thee in earnest prayer. Soon glory blind and clouded there will be no need for prayer rapture your praise and endless worship will be our sweet portion The splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice. Let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light. Trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. See how great, how great is our God. to age he stands. 
Father, we thank you this morning. You are great, you are mighty, you are wonderful. Help us to value you above all things. Let us not run after anything else that takes place, takes the place of you in our hearts and in our lives. Before everything else, you are primary. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Say something briefly to you. Uh, we have returned from COVID. Uh, our whole church, uh, at some point, uh, has now been back in public worship in either this service or the other, uh, and I am so thankful for that. Uh, the next step is service, because worship is not the only thing that a church does. We also have the Great Commission that Jesus has given us to go and to make disciples. And so I want to ask that you begin to pray about where and how God wants you to serve there are many opportunities in this church and through this church, and not all within the walls, but also outside the walls. And so all of your time should not be spent here. You should also be out in the world being the light of the world and sharing the gospel where you go. And so uh, my prayer for you as you leave is that God would bless you with the honor of being able to share the gospel with someone else, that you would be salt and light where you were placed, that you would be able to spot and walk away from the temptation to solve problems the world's way, and that you would see Jesus, and that Jesus would reveal himself to you and through you. I pray these things in the name of our King Jesus. Amen. You're dismissed. <laughs>